Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Boy, I was listening to that last song and it started reminding me of uh, the school that I went to from K through 12, which was Holy Name of Jesus School. So thank you. Great, great name, great songs. Appreciate it. I want to welcome all of you who are newcomers here tonight. Uh, you're welcome to be here, and we will have a special program for you, which we will go into after this large group session ends, approximately 7 o'clock tonight, so stand by. Uh, mention a few items. First of all, the word over there, restroom, also stands for bathrooms, loo, whatever word you use in your vocabulary, but it's right over there uh, to your right. That's... This is a non-smoking campus, so if you really have to smoke, we ask that you go outside and go to one of the outside sidewalks. Uh, if you haven't already, we ask that you either silence or turn off your cell phone so we're not interrupted. Our literature table doesn't have anybody, oh, it does have someone standing there, I'm sorry. Mike is filling in for Lauren, thank you so much. <laughs> and we had our greeter, Tim, so if you haven't already said hi, thank you so much. And now we're going to go to a special announcements, which is our A coach. Here's Freya. Hey, Forever Family. I'm a grateful believer, struggles with codependency and depression. My name is Freya. Glad to see all your faces here tonight. So happy that you've joined us. And um, our, our announcements, if you are looking for a step study, and really need to dig into the steps. Men's step study, they started last week. They are meeting on Thursday nights. Talk to these two characters over here, Tim and Mike, and they're running Thursday nights in room A112, A112, from 6 to 8 p.m., okay, Thursday nights. So talk to them if you're interested. And women, if you're interested in a step study, we're gearing up, talk to me and Tammy. And um, that's our announcements, thanks. Okay, now we have my uh, readers, which I gave a lot of notice to just before I walked up. So here's Tammy and Lauren. My name's Lauren. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And I got here through issues with alcohol, uh, which caused a broken marriage. So here I am, and I'm glad I'm here. Hi. Hey. Ooh, I'm going to lower this a little bit. Hi, my name's Tammy. I'm also a grateful believer, and I struggle with codependency and post-abortion regret. Hi, Tammy. Okay, here we go. Uh, number one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out, Romans 7, 18. Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2, 13. Number three, we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, Romans 12, 1. Number four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord, Lamentations 3:40. Number five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Number six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4.10. Number seven, we humbly ask him to remove all our shortcomings. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Number eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. Number nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Number 10, we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Number 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. Number 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore them gently but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6, 1. Through God's grace, lasting change is possible. Woohoo! Thank, thanks, Tammy and Lauren. Okay, the next part of our program is, to me, the real nuts and bolts of our large group, and that's where we either have a lesson or testimony and tonight we are honored to have a really great testimony because I got to see some of the preliminaries. Uh, our speaker tonight is Sal. He's the ministry leader from First Baptist Church and Sal, come on up. <laughs> While he's coming up, let me make a pitch. If anybody is listening to this over YouTube, we meet every Tuesday night here at Quail Lakes Baptist Church starting at 6.15 to 8.15 for a live thing. We do our social distancing and all of that, but you are welcome to start coming here in person. And at this time, I'm going to interview Sal for just a moment because Sal, like I mentioned, is the ministry leader at First Baptist Church. So Sal, tell us what time and where you meet. First Baptist here in Stockton, California at 6 o'clock in the, uh, what we call our large community center, which is, used to be, for those who are from Stockton, the Scottish Rite Temple. But we bought that about three years ago, and now it's being used for the glory of God. And what time do you start? 6 o'clock. All, right. All right. So, without further ado, let me introduce our testimony for tonight. Here's Sal. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you've done in my life. And Lord, I don't know where all the people in this room are at tonight, whether they have a relationship with you um, or they've had it for a long time. And for those who are listening to us online right now, I pray that they would hear what you have done in my life, that I know that if it wasn't for you, I would not be standing here right now. Father, I'm so thankful that you have chosen me and restored me that you bought, re, brought redemption into my life. And for those with ears to hear, let them hear what you have done. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Step one says that we, are admitted, we admit that we are powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and our lives have become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out, Romans 7.18. Hello, my name is Sal, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm in recovery from drugs and pornography. Thanks, All right. My earliest memories in life are the death of President Kennedy, an earthquake that was 9.2 on the Richter scale that lasted almost five minutes, 
and my parents giving me my dad's Playboy magazines to look at. To say that I was set up with a warped sense of intimacy from the very beginning of my life only begins to tell my story. As people in recovery will tell you, chaos and dysfunction were the norms in the life growing up, and mine was no different, except for an added benefit of what many of my family did for a living. You see, in my family, criminal activity was beyond drugs and DUIs. I had a grandmother who was a prostitute, a grandfather that served time for killing a man. My father would tell me stories of men who were brought into San Francisco to try and kill him, and then he showed me the scars of being stabbed with an ice pick. We even had family friend who was turned state's evidence because he was hired to take other human beings' lives. These are the stories and events that filled my mind and my youth as I grew up. They gave me a false idea of what a man should be like. Yet these events are not the things that hurt me the most in life. It was being betrayed by my family that hurt the most and the deepest. Since both my parents were raised in these types of environments, neither knew how to be great parents. Both suffered from their own sense of trauma that they endured that, they endured, that affected them. And they just passed it along to their kids. The real hurtful trauma started to happen when I was 11 years old and I came home from school. Uh, my mother had left and taken my sister with her without saying anything. She had just left. No goodbyes, no reason, she just left. I might add at this point that my sister that she had took with her had tried to murder me twice. Once by trying to stab me with scissors, another time by crushing, no she didn't try to, she actually did stab me with scissors, excuse me, another time trying to crush my head with a baseball bat. See, I can relate to King David when he cries out to Daddy God in Psalms 27.10, for my father and mother forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. See, when my mom and sister had left, my dad's only words to me were, well, I guess we're going to be bachelors for a while. My walls of not trusting and not being able to open up about my feelings started at that very moment. I went numb and had no way of expressing how I was hurting. I started to wear the mask of denial. Coupled that time with my dad starting to tell me stories of what the family was really like, all the crime and violence and sin that he seemed to be bragging about, or at least never saying these things were wrong. He also started leaving more pornography laying around that I could view. I would escape into the imagery and the stories from my dad, thinking that these were the normal ways people lived. My dad's drinking started to get really bad at this time, as well as his continuing smoking of marijuana. Since this was 1972, and he was in his mid-40s, we would call him somewhat of a trendsetter since he had been smoking pot since the mid-50s. You see, my father had lied about his age and joined the military during World War II. He was a Marine. There's got a fellow Marine over there I want to point out. I now understand that he suffered from his childhood and his time in the military. So another lesson I learned was to dumb, numb the pain through drugs and alcohol. My father would give me advice. One such nugget that he would say over and over again to me is if you pull a gun on somebody, make sure you kill them, because if you don't, they're going to come back and kill you. All these wonderful events and stories and advice before I even reached the age of 12. Life went on with my dad, who retired from the military when I was 14. By this time, <clears throat> excuse me, by this time I was deep into using drugs and alcohol to feel good. When I was 15, he took a job as a merchant sailor, meaning he would leave me at home and send me money each month to pay the bills and take care of things. Once again, a family member was leaving me. At least this time, I had some form of warning. <clears throat> excuse me. I was 15 years old with a five-bedroom house without any supervision or boundaries. It was a recipe for disaster. You don't have to be a mathematician to figure out the, the outcome of this equation. It's really a simple math problem. 15-year-old walking raging hormone without supervision or boundaries, with a large income, and access to all the alcohol and drugs he gets his hands on. That he even showed up for school was a minor miracle. Trouble did follow, including being arrested and spending time in juvenile hall, yet somehow I was able to slip through the cracks and still survive on my own, if what I was doing you can call surviving. My life was spiraling out of control. I began to get involved in dealing drugs, stealing cars, and robbing businesses and breaking into homes. I jokingly called it pharmaceutical sales, automobile acquisition and redistribution, and the procurement of household items and business inventories. You see, I tried to find humor in my warped way of trying to prove myself. I was hiding behind another mask, acting as if I was strong and able to handle the pain and the abandonment I was feeling. It was during this time in my life I started thinking about God. You see, I was raised Catholic. 
I had a belief and form of reverence for God, but I just didn't know who he was. I can remember one night after being up all night under the influence of all sorts of drugs, including acid, that I came out of my drug stupor haze crying out to God to show himself to me. I would often remember a Bible tract that a little old lady gave me once while I was waiting in the car while my parents were in the store shopping. Now, for some of you that are not my age, the parents used to do that. They'd leave you in the car with the keys, and they would go shopping. I think that's a Class B felony now. I never forgot that message that attracted that the lady gave me that night. These questions remained with me even in my drug-induced teenage years. I just didn't know any Christians, and my friends sure didn't have the answers. So I plunged forward in my sin and path of destruction. My destructive lifestyle was my mantra to mask my pain. When I turned 18, the summer before my senior year in high school, my dad stopped sending me money and told the landlord that we no longer were in need of the house. I was now homeless and without a steady cash flow from my dad. Even though at that time I had a very good job, I just couldn't stay out of trouble. See, up to that time, all my arrests were for minor things, such as uh, minor in possession of alcohol or small marijuana. But by the grace of God, I seemed to never get caught doing serious crimes. When I was arrested at 19, along with another friend, for stealing some tools for a person that he knew, things went bad real fast. I had nobody to turn to and found myself without a job and facing evictions. I couch surfed and then eventually found myself not sure where to turn to. I, was in, I had this false illusion that my trial would be a fast one and wandered somewhat aimlessly until I found my way to the rescue mission in San Jose, California. It was there that I found books about God and his plan for mankind through his son, Jesus Christ. I even came across a book that answered all the questions I had about that track that little old lady had given me 20 years before. What a blessed saint of Jesus, and I can't wait to see her one day. I would read this book, and I felt that I needed Christ. So one day, while reading the book, under the influence, because I thought it would be enlightening, I prayed out to God that I was a sinner. I needed forgiveness and I did, that I didn't want to go to hell. I felt the presence of God fall upon me, and I was no longer high. I was not sure what to think of. I mean, who would believe such a wild kid like me that I just experienced something so supernatural? Even I didn't believe what just happened. I wasn't sure I was a Christian yet. I was able to give up drugs and uh, upon my salvation from, excuse me, I was able to give up at my salvation the dependency on drugs but I became a, when I became a Christian and I felt that I was healed but the problem was I never worked out the healing with the areas that got me started using the drugs to begin with. I slowly started to grow my walk and found a home church where I started to attend a college age kids class all from good homes and middle class families. In reality, I felt so out of place. But I quickly started to become more like them and talk like them. You know, speak Christianese. I would hear such Bible verses like 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. But there was a part of me that struggled with that verse. I couldn't put my finger on what was nagging me. You see, what it was was the pain and loneliness I had carried for so many years. It was such a part of me that it was like a mole on my back. I could not feel it, I couldn't see it, but it was a very part of my very fiber. I'm an outgoing person that was very good at deflecting my true feelings. I was wearing a mask. I would not even allow God into my trust completely. I would still struggle with sin and pornography from time to time. And when I would seek help, I would just get the ever old famous words, just stop it. <laughs> trust me, if that's all it would take, I would have stopped. But then I was also said that I did it on my own and not need Christ to help me as well. Remember, I had to admit that I was powerless. I was still in denial about the pain of my life from my youth. I got married at the age of 26 because my girlfriend at the time was pregnant. Not the best way to start a marriage. I came to realize that even though I loved her, I married her out of duty more than love. We had three children and 13 years of struggle before she left me and filed divorce. My old abandonment issues arose again, and I plunged into my addiction to pornography to mask my pain, and when the guilt and shame arose, I chased it down with alcohol. I grew tired of sin and vowed to stop and never sin again. Yet again, I was trying to, to just stop and not deal with the real issues of pain and trusting God, who would not leave me. I was divorced for five years when I met a, met a woman, and we soon decided to get married after dating, get, dating for a short period of time. Welcome to struggled marriage number two. 
She had three kids, and I had three kids. Please do not start humming the Brady Bunch song. It became old a long time ago. We bought a house, and I completed my college degree and even started my own business all at the same time. These events, coupled with her not getting along with my kids and shutting them out of our lives, led to a tremendous amount of stress. I returned to my old coping habits of my addiction via the internet. I now have the world wide web at my fingertips to feed my addiction to numb my pain and stress. I was caught, vowed to stop. It never could stay clean for more than a month or so. It was a constant binge purge, binge purge cycle. In 2014, she left me and filed for divorce. It wasn't too long before I went off the deep end and my life was completely out of control. So I'd lost my marriage, then I would soon lose my house and eventually lose my business. Yet I still worked, I still would put on my mask and, ask every, and act as if everything was okay. Yet before the madness and sin got out of control to where I lost everything, I prayed out to God a simple prayer, simple but scary prayer. God, do whatever you need to do in my life to get it straight with you. Like God needs my permission. How arrogant of me. The simple yet scary prayer was transformational for me. I became a Christian seeking God by myself. I never allowed folks in my life. I never spent time being discipled by other brothers or truly understand what the cost of being a disciple of Christ, a disciple of Christ is. Yet I prayed a simple prayer that had significant impact. You see, God wanted to heal me of my past hurts and free me of my sinful habits. And I was seeking it with a quick, simple prayer or altar call. I wanted a million-dollar answer with a five-cent prayer. In reality, healing can be a messy, painful experience at times. But it's through that process we find real freedom. We do not serve a microwave God. We serve a God that wants complete control and needs to bring us to complete dependence on him and not ourselves. After God got me to the point of complete desperation, almost to the point of me crying out like Jonah did in chapter 2, verse 2, he said, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Shoal, I cried, and he heard my vo voice. Yes, folks, I was whale puke. Then a good friend of mine named Dennis Barrett, who lives here in Stockton, called me because I had been ignoring him. He was supposed to be my accountability partner. I was lying to him on a, on a tremendous basis. Out of desperation, I finally, I finally became honest about how messed up my life was, and he offered a suggestion that I move to Stockton and join a new life program at the Gospel Center Rescue Mission. And without giving it much thought, I said yes. Two weeks later, all of my stuff was in storage, and I walked through the door, a beaten, tattered, tattered man. I was a prodigal son now walking into town, the walk of shame so deep, I would rather be dead than face it. I started to go to classes and attend Celebrate Recovery. At the mission, you do have to do the 12-step study that really digs into why we are addicted and what that, that the addiction is a symptom of what's really going on. For me, in my case, it was the pain of abandonment and at times feeling less than. <clears throat> Excuse me. I felt as if I did not have a family. I had felt alone. Yet God showed up in my life big time and brought healing through all the junk. I was chasing after relationships to heal my pain. In reality, it was only God who can heal that pain. Step five says we admit to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5.16. See, I knew what God had forgiven me. I just never want to let anybody know about my pain and sin that I'd struggled with. Part of my process of recovery was allowing Daddy God to heal me from all that pain. By the time I came to the rescue mission, both my parents and my sister had passed away. Th thankfully, <clears throat> they had all accepted the Lord, all three basically pulling the deathbed repentance trick, as I call it. I'm okay with that since I would get to see them in heaven. But you see, the lingering issue was that I had not truly forgiven my family. I had gave it some lip service, but I had still not dealt with the pain. I realize that forgiveness is a choice and it is a daily prayer for me to choose to forgive for those who have wronged me. The biggest challenge was choosing to forgive myself. Through prayer and crying out to God, I've forgiven my family and myself, and I'm learning to be open and honest with my feelings and quit hiding behind a mask of bravado. 
the same grace that saved me, healed me. After completing a new life six-month program at the Gospel Center Risk Commission, for some strange reason, they decided to hire me as director of administration <laughs> the very next day. <laughs> it was there that God continued to heal me, <clears throat> heal me and for me to get to know him as my daddy God, who will, who will never leave or forsake me. Then an interesting thing happened in the spring of 2017. First Baptist Church of Stockton approached me to come work for them as a ministry leader to celebrate recovery. And after prayer, I accepted the position. When they first approached me, I felt like Robert De Niro in Taxi talking to me, right? Because it just didn't seem right to me in my head. However, it was during this time that I had the privilege to attend the CR Summit. <clears throat> I had to be honest as I looked at the speaker and artists that were going to be there. Two stood out to me as not too exciting. The first was Plum. I have nothing against her, but I find it hard to relate to a woman's struggle. I'm sure that women here struggle with being called mankind or how throughout the Bible it refers to the fall of man. Well, as a man, I struggle with being called the bride of Christ. In the same light, Plum's music was just too touchy-feely for my taste. It's called Denial, in case you didn't know. By her, second so by her second song, my eyeballs started to sweat. The second artist who came out that I didn't really want to hear was a small little lady named Hosanna Wong. I have nothing against poetry, except that I normally don't like it. <clears throat> but like I said, I have nothing against it. I just hate it. When Hosanna Poetry came out, her first poem was about the very neighborhood I'm from in San Francisco. She had me right away. I was floored. The next day, she shared a poem called I Have a New Name. In that poem, she called out many names from the Bible that give us new names. As she listed them, I heard the still small voice of Daddy God calling me his child. When she came to the last name, child of God, I had what I call the sup-sups. In case you don't know what that is, that's, where you, <laughs> that's a sup-sup. I was really worried about it because there was a gentleman next to me that had tattoos all up and down his arms, and I could tell that he got his muscles in prison, so I was worried about crying in front of him. I glanced over him in the midst of my sup-sups. He was too busy crying louder and more than me, so I was pretty safe at that point. But see, Daddy God had brought tremendous healing to me and in me. I was a part of this forever family. I was in his family, and the old abandoned issues were being healed. But Dad, Daddy God wasn't done with me yet. Shortly after returning to Stockton, he opened the door to me, work full-time at FBC, First Baptist Church in Stockton as director of operations to continue my work and celebrate recovery. It was to fulfill his promise to me. You see, when I first came to Stockton, God gave me a Bible verse, Jeremiah 15, 9. It says, this is how the Lord responds. If you return to me, I will restore you so you can continue to serve me. If you speak good words rather than worthless ones, you will be my spokesman. You must influence them. Don't let them influence you. Since then, I've become a licensed minister and a full-time pastor at First Baptist. And Daddy God has helped me in restoring my life. I have a better relationship with my children, and Daddy God has shown me so much more about his grace and character. I want to encourage anybody struggling with painful issues to call out to Daddy God so that he can bring about real healing. Work the steps. Allow God to show you how to deal with the issues that hurt you. Hebrews 13.5 in the message translation says, don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have. Since God assured us, I'll never let you down. I'll never walk off, and I'll never leave you. We can boldly quote, God is there, ready to help. I am fearless no matter what. Who or what can get me? So I'm still working on areas of the insecurity in my life, and I acknowledge that I will be working on my stuff until I leave this planet. Yet I am sure that he has me in his hands. Remember, if you don't heal what hurt you, you'll only bleed on people who didn't cut you. Thank you for allowing me to tell you my story about how Daddy God has healed me in the midst of all my nests. My name is Sal, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ.
Okay, again, thank you so much, Sal, for taking time out and coming this evening. Uh, for newcomers, anybody that this is your first time that you've been here, uh, we invite you to meet us over by where Mike and Tim are hanging around, and we will have some people that will be teaching you the newcomers class. In fact, it's Tim is one of them and Tammy. So uh, you're welcome to do that. Without further ado, then, let me go to the finality, which is our serenity prayer in its full. So we'll have a few minutes of silence and then uh, go from there. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Remember, we meet back here at 8 o'clock, including our snacks, and uh, now you're free to go to your small support groups. Thank you.